All right. Okay, so the recording is ongoing. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this sixth round of WSDC. Um, congrats for making it this far. Um, my name is Sabina. I will be the chair of this round. I'm from Romania. I prefer she, her pronouns, but please do address us as a panel. Uh, together with me, judging, I have Rock, Shruti, and um, Sena. And um, I wish you all good luck. Uh, I will try to be... Uh, I see that we do have a volunteer, uh, Chen, uh, who will help us with the time. Um, so we will have time signals in the chat. Um, for your preferred POIs, uh, please let us know before the speech and during your introductions. I see that uh, Team Latvia has already announced their speaking order in the chat. So if Team uh, Mongolia could do the same, uh, it would be wonderful. So we have Team Mongolia on prop, Team Latvia on op. And if my panelists would like to say hi, I warmly invite them to uh, do so now. Hello, uh, my name is Rock, as Sabina already said. Um, good luck. Good luck for the round. Shruti, we only heard the last part, so if you could, um, could say. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is this better? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Shruti. My pronouns are she or her. Good luck for the round. Hi, I'm Senna. Um, good luck for the round. Wonderful. So uh, this is the moment to ask questions, clarifications, or um, to start the debate if there are none. So um, the silence, I think, means that there are no clarifications needed. So I invite the first speaker of Team Proposition um, to take the floor. Here, here. Am I audible? All right. Um, I'd like my POIs verbally like audibly, and I will start my speech in three, two, one. Pessimistic political action is the main enemy to the progression of a society. Two point uh, panel, I'm, I'm the first speaker of side proposition and two points of setup before I move on to my constructive. Firstly, on our characterization of political fiction. A, po on positive and optimistic political fiction, we, we, we define this as works that communicate hopeful messages to readers and refrain from overly antagonizing one political ideology, but instead remains open to criticism. And um, they would have often, they would often have happy endings. For example, this would look like Fahrenheit 4, 451 or video games like Disco Elysium. B, um, on negative and pessimistic political um, fictions, we define this as fiction that incites fear and generally antagonizes one ideology. And usually almost almost always have bad endings. This looks like 1984 or Animal Farm and Brave New World, etc. Secondly, on characterization of who reads these works and why this is important and to what extent are to, to what extent are they influenced by them. So the most important stakeholder in this debate would be the youth. Typically, the youth are exposed to political fi fiction as a part of their education curriculum, and we believe many young adults are prone to consuming political fiction prior to engaging in real life politics, which uh, po politics, whichever kind of political fiction is consumed more becomes prevalent in people's minds and prejudices surrounding political ide ideologies and the way they're portrayed are likely to become internalized by, by the time these children or young adults start forming their own political opinions and participating in these kind of uh things okay i'll take that isn't surveillance and overt authoritarianism just simply bad and we should demonize it? The, the motion clearly states that we're um decreasing we prefer a positive po positive political fiction over um the negative ones that like you mentioned like authority uh, with a theme surrounding authoritarianism, et cetera, we're not exactly demonizing them. So moving on, thirdly, the critical question in this debate is whether positive and optimistic political fiction motivates people and, and incentivizes them to act. And the moment we answer this question is the moment we win. We bring you two arguments in this debate today. Firstly, on positive political fiction, normalizing all political ideologies. Secondly, on in 
on how in how it invigorates an individual's role in society. Our first argument, positive political fiction normalizes all ideologies. In this, so basically, people have become prone to defining themselves through the political ideology that they believe in, and people become characterized by their preferred ideology instead of their ind individual qualities. For example, if you're a conservative, you're seen as a gun-loving lo maniac. If you are a liberal, you're seen as a baby murderer. So the problem has become widespread to the degree that 44% of Americans would not marry somebody with an opposing ideology opposing political opinion than you. So what does positive political fiction achieve here? Firstly, positive political fiction affirms people that their ideologies are acceptable. For example, Roadside Picnic covers aspects of an ideal pure democracy contra contrasted with autocratic values. At the end, happiness is brought to everyone. And the overall message of these political books are never about whether a political opinion should be right or wrong. It's more so about individuals and the main characters deriving happiness in whatever form they can they can like uh in like whatever they believe in believe in so secondly on positive political fiction like being likely to create respect among different groups so political fiction teaches that everything is good people are more likely to accept the criticism from such works if their belief is simultaneously affirmed so would a kid so would a kid be open to acknowledge their mistakes if they're told they're trash or if they're told that they're fine and 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 it's okay to make mistakes right so people not by having this people are not only willing to acknowledge the mistakes of their political ideology and, and the harms they have potentially but also notice the positives of other groups wherein their theirs falls short so the impact here is firstly there's more disinformation no, thank you. Since positive political fiction normalizes all beliefs, people are inclined to talk to each other for the best of all worlds, and they're unlikely to remain in its shell. So, so, so weighing here, a thousand people taught that every form of governance is fine versus a thousand people taught that everything but their preferred form of governance is terrible, which would have healthier discourse and a homogenous society. So we would definitely prefer the, the thousand people who were, who were uh, who grew up on like positive political fiction, right? So secondly, we believe this leads to self-love. We say that positive political fiction highlights positive human qualities versus constantly, no, thank you, constantly criticizing only a person's political ideology. Now people are more willing to notice their best size and focus on it more, leading to uh, people being less sad, less bullying based on political alignment or ideologies. So moving on to my second argument, how it invigorates on individuals' role in the system. The premise here is that any country with any political ideology is based on the people's willingness to work towards achieving the best version of it, right? So we believe pessimistic political fiction sends the message of hopelessness, like Brave New World's whole plot revolved around banishing political dissenters, right? So the we believe the power of the system takes precedence over the willpower of individuals. Point of information. Oh, thank you. This creates two issues. Firstly, apathetic individuals who do not care to find solutions to problems in their society. So if conditioned to believe that resistance is futile through these books that side opposition would support, would this would these people would never take action to resist in the first place. Secondly, people are unlikely to call out problems within a government, leading them to believe that regardless of adopted political ideology, governments will always fail. So positive political fiction gives people Firstly, at the end of the tunnel by sending message of you can fight the system. Secondly, we believe this encourages people that we can battle the injustice or the flaws in our society and actually win. I'll actually take that point before I move on. Given that we don't live in the world of Brave New World, is it more or less likely that there is still some hope left and that pointing out these issues is important? Pointing out these issues is important, but giving hope to kids who, to, to the majority of the people, audience read, consuming this media is giving hope to them is important. And uh, we're, we're actually still keeping um, the, 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 the pessimistic political uh, fictions in the, in the status quo. So um, it, it, it works anyway. So for, for example, like America's decided to revolt and fight for their independence because they thought they're, they, 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 they deserve better. They believe that they can do it. And like, 
Here, we believe people are more incentivized to act in desire of a better situation because, for example, in, in, in the book 1984, Winston, the main character, decided to work against the government because he thought he can achieve a better world where he can be himself and not be under control of an autocratic regime. But the problem here is at the end of 1984, his hope had no meaning. This is why we reject the majority of political fictions being pessimistic because we want hope in our in, in our children. And we uniquely on, on our side, we have um, individuals as an impact. We have individuals who fight against injustice to create a better society. We get people who do not get knocked down by harsh reality realities and never get up as opposed to side Latvia. So, um, so proud to propose. I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And if my panel is ready, I give the floor to the first speaker of team opposition here, here. Okay, hi, I'm just the tech that I'm audible and visible. I hope I am. Okay, great, yeah, just a second. <clears throat> okay, uh, pronouns she, her, and um, POIs, preferably in the chat. So just write POI and I'll take you when I can. Just open up the chat, all right. Starting in three, two, one. A utopian fiction which preaches an ideal depiction of the world at times when the reality is anything but that panel that's not beneficial, that is dangerous. Before I move on to a few points of rebuttal, I'll have like the framing that we hold in this debate. So we think firstly, right, the role of political fiction in society, which wasn't pointed out by proposition, it's important, not in the way that you immediately go and vote by based off of like what you've read, but rather that you're able to draw parallels and that these books offer you like a key insight on the problems facing our world today, right? So you're able to identify key issues and then like vote to change them or like start action to change them, right? It gives you motivation to actually tackle these things and point out the problem in the first place, right? Also note that most people read like these books to, so that they can understand and they can know more, right? It's generally educational material. Now, a few points of rebuttal. Firstly, on their framing, right? We think it's like unclear why we can't have good endings. Technically, like it's about like maybe the pest, the book is pessimistic in its nature, but it can end well. That's not like exclusive to their side, right? It's also like unclear why like for us, we would have to have a prevalent political ideology, but they cannot. I think that this is pretty, like both teams can have a prevalent ideology in their books. Both teams can also not have that, right? And and furthermore, it's also not just the youth that read these books, right? I think it's generally anyone who wants to educate themselves. Sure, okay, you know, youth read this in their like curriculums, etc. I think like a fair bit of adults also read it as well. Um, and then quickly two areas of rebuttal. Firstly, they talk about like acceptance, oh, about like normalizing other political ideologies. And secondly, about like, oh, respecting more people. And I think that this is based off of, I guess, like buying into other people's political ideology. You read about it and you think, oh, this is not, you know, this is a pretty good thing, right? I think I have like two responses. Firstly, you can probably buy into bad ideologies as well. It's probably also harmful. I don't want people reading like a utilitarian, uh, uh, I don't want people reading a book about like an ethno state, about like a perfect world in which there's only like one race. And I don't want people buying into that. And secondly, it's not clear why this like uh, acceptance thing is not ex like is exclusive, right? We can have on our side how people how people read about like dystopian books about their own political ideology and change those ideas based on that. Second area of rebuttal then about hopelessness. Uh, I think this is like the better line of analysis coming from them. Um, they tell you like, oh, you know, people read this and they lose hope. I have two responses to this. Firstly, it's like as Caldas told you in that POI, which we didn't get a response to. You people don't live in this state right now, right? They can see like they can do things to change that in democratic societies. So that like motivates them. It's not like they live in the like the, the dystopia, right? And secondly, they tell you it's bad. Like you call out the government no matter what panel. I think it's very good to call out governments when you think that there are key issues that they are not addressing. We're like happy to have that on our side of the house. Then two arguments in my speech. Firstly, why a negative outlook is a stronger motivator. And secondly, why fiction 
about why fiction with a positive outlook feeds into propaganda. First argument about why a negative outlook is a stronger motivator. So the question here is what motivates people more to take action, right? Proposition cannot just get away with proving supposedly that like people read their like positive outlook books and then take action. This is the comparative or where they're more likely, they are more motivated to do so. There are six points on why that happens on our side of the house. I'll take your POIs after this argument. Firstly, it's because we buy into people's shock and appall, right? If they are scared for their future, if they feel like their children might not grow up with the same like civil liberties that they do, they're very scared, right? That's pretty threatening. It's a natural reaction to do anything to stop that from happening, right? It's a quite selfish reaction, but it's one that gets them to vote. It's one that gets them to start action, right? Secondly, they are more likely to recognize negative traits in their own government, right? Because these, gov uh, because these books point out failures in the government or like more authoritarian governments, it's easier to notice like traits that your own government has that are also like parallel within, like, within these books, right? Therefore, you're able to more like accurately attack your own government and lobby for change within it. And thirdly, you get like once you are pretty complacent, because realistically, this happens like mostly in you know Western countries where people have the free time to read these books, right? These people are probably in a pretty comfortable situation, right? And so like it's more of a motivational factor that some of these liberties and comforts might be taken away from them, right? So in a dystopia, they would be taken away from them rather than have like more added on. This is pretty like important. Right? Because in a utopia, you're saying like, oh, you know, your life's going to be more comfortable. It's a better motivator for people who already live in comfortable situations to say rather, oh, in this dystopia, this com these comforts will be taken away. This is literally like why politicians rely on fear mongering because it's more impactful. And um, Fourthly, right, when you have this negative fiction, it highlights problems that need to be solved, right? It's a lot easier to think about specific problems and how to solve them rather than understanding this like uh, ut uh, utopia, right, which doesn't really explain the steps to get there, right? It's just a lot easier to highlight the specific key issues within governments and the status quo. And, um, and, and, and fifthly, right, utopias are often quite far fetched, right? For example, like living in painless societies where everyone feels a lot of happiness. Compare that to the dystopias we have on our side of the house which is like, oh, big brother is watching. It's quite a realistic scenario. It's not something like, oh, everyone always feels happiness. It's rather than the government is always watching you, which is like what we're moving closer to, right? And then, um, and lastly, you can actually draw parallels with the real world. You're able to see, oh, look at like the effects of climate change. Our planet is literally burning up. I read a book about what this will look like in the next 50 years. This let, like, lets these people envision themselves in a more dramatic world than the one we live in today, but one that is extended uh, like from the problems that we face today, right? So people can physically envision themselves in those situations and like can draw parallels with the real world, which motivates them much more to take action. And this is very important because this is like a stronger motivator that helps you invest more in politics. Literally just based on your natural instinct, you feel threatened. You feel, no, I don't want to live in that world, right? You're more likely to invest yourself more. And, uh, and this helps because of the like, drastic situation in our world. We want people to invest themselves more. Before I move on to the second argument, I'll take that POI. Please note that both positive and negative or pessimistic political fiction are both exposing all these, all the government's shortcomings. However, on side, uh, on these positive fictions, the ending is where the main character actually ends up overthrowing the government, or actually ends up battling yeah. that. Okay. This is what I talked about in my framing. Like, it's unclear why we can't have a positive ending. But either way, in utopias, it's not usually that you like highlight the negative parts of that uh, of the government because that like that would buy into people's negative emotions, and at that point, they are like stepping over the sides of the house. Second argument about why fiction with positive outlook feeds into more propaganda. So this is like buying that they actually have efficacy, right? I told you in our first argument where we're more likely to have effects, right? I don't think they are, but if they are, why is it more harmful? So the thesis of this is that politicians genuinely have an incentive to latch onto propositions fiction because it has a very rosy and nice outcome and they need votes. Three points here. Firstly, it's because it idealizes like a certain ideology as all do, right? But it's easier for them like politicians or parties to, for example, like pay off uh, authors to release some sort of book in which like, I don't know, the Republican neoliberal agenda like plummets into this like eco state, uh, ethno state, which is like perfect and rosy and no one has any like problems because they're all white and perfect and something like that, right? It's like highly likely. It's like it helps people, uh, these, these politicians to like uh, further these like very harmful narratives. 
Secondly, it's just a lot easier to exploit because it like tends to people's cognitive wants. People want a good world, right? People want a rosy world where there is no problem, right? I.e., it's like uh, easier for like uh, authors and like politicians to like present this perfect alternative and not present the mechanisms that are needed to get there. So it helps like further the, uh, the narratives of different uh, populists who have no real like actual answers to get to these uh, the, these perfect worlds, right? And lastly, and this is very important, it often uh, it like furthers the narrative that the ends just Justify the means because you see this perfect utopia, right? For example, the US wanting to like supposedly secure all of their people like these liberties, but you don't see the mechanisms on which they get there, right? You don't see the fact that the US is also exploiting developing nations to get the money to do that, right? This is all hidden with this like narrative of, oh, we're living in a utopia. So panel, if proposition has any efficacy, it doesn't even play in their favor because letting people fall for a fairy tale and the urgency of the real world only brings false hope. I thank the speaker for the fine speech, and if everyone is ready, I give the floor to the second speaker of the proposition here, here. And I hope I'm visible. <clears throat> it's ready real quick. And double check he, him pronouns. I like my verbal POIs and names in the thing. In, in the thing. I guess I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Negative po political fiction often promotes this, this world where everything is bad, everything is where all these political systems are created to oppress the population and the population itself is docile and, and can't think of ever rising up or can't have anything to go against it. However, when we have all this negative fiction, all of this majority negative fiction telling us about, about, about all this, about these political systems, what ends up happening is we turn our readers into the very people inside these books. All we do now, firstly, to a few balls on side, opposition speech. Their first argument has been all about how we have these, how political fiction is created to draw parallels between the fictional government and the real government and identify key issues. However, we do not see how that positive does not actually exist on our side of the house. We, we have these, we, instead, power, instead of drawing parallels to a bad system, we can draw parallels to a good system. And what we have, what we don't have yet, or what problems we have, and we can fix to actively get there. Side opposition only has this terrible idea. It's like you're, when your mom tells you to look at that drunk person and say, don't drink because that's what you'll end up as. You don't actively see what you can do to make yourself better. You don't actively see what, what solutions you have. You can only identify problems without actively giving us any guidance on what to do, on what we should do further. In addition, their entire framing of this debate on how they can have good endings too, and that how our how fiction instead has to be on utopias versus dystopias, we simply disagree. First of all, the motion itself gives examples as such as West Wing and Fahrenheit 451, where there are actively dystopias and are actively showing these negative parts of society. However, the delta between Fahrenheit 451 and works like Brave New World in 1984 is exactly the ending where these systems are actively toppled and we create a better system where we can actually have this goalpost be put into people's minds. This is the delta here in this debate, whether we have a goalpost to move towards or a bad example to move away from. We believe that the goalpost is better. Now, second of all, on the idea of which side is has a better, creates better activism in our society. Now, side, side opposition likes to think that they have the more efficient method, but that by having these problems and by having this shock factor, we can push people towards actively doing things. However, this is simply not true. I will go over it more on my third argument, but to address it very quickly, the efficacy of the of these negative nihilistic political fiction is that what it actually does it is it shows problems and it doesn't and all it does is promote people and pushes them against these specific problems. It doesn't actually show people what they can do against them. Second of all, they actually they actually do create this kind of 
Selectivism, where when you see this problem and you see it everywhere in your society, you suddenly think, wow, this is such a bad problem and that I can't do anything to solve it because in the book, there was no way to solve it. So how should a person like me ever be able to solve it? It creates this negative mentality where you can't change anything and thus it's not very efficient at all. Now, moving on to my third argument, but before I move on, any POIs? Current Hate uh, 451 and Westling also don't like show you how to fix society and probably no author can really do that, right? So it's not actually up to the book to show you ways how to solve society, but actually to like empower you and to like make you want to do that. We completely agree. And that's why we believe that our side is better because instead, because even if they don't have this kind of idea or exact solutions, they do show you what kind of future to strive towards, what kind of future to fight for, and actively push you to give you an incentive to get there instead of just using a stick to show you don't go that way, don't go that way. It's, it's better to use the carrot than the stick is basically what we believe in this debate. Now, finally, moving on to my third argument, which is how nihilistic political fiction promotes polarization. In a world where the majority of political fiction has a cynical message about the world, it becomes the majority of political fiction consumed. As a result, the entire generation of people now hold a negative perception of the current political system in our world. Our population is then whipped up into a frenzy according to whatever message is chosen to be demonized, whether it be communism, fascism, or capitalism. Two layers of analysis as to how this polarization actually manifests. First of all, how ne this negative political fiction becomes populist propaganda. It incites fear in people against a certain political ideology, i.e. animal farm, as to how communism was in effect or <coughs> brave new world as to how eugenics works. It only shows people how these problems arise and thus it incentivizes politicians to take advantage of it and say, this is the kind of thing we need to stay away from. This is why you should believe in our, in our points as to how we can get away from that. Now, side opposition has stated that, for example, we could have that. However, we believe that we have less of this kind of political use because when you have a positive message, instead of dividing people along whether you agree with that issue or not, it actually shows what kind of idea our society should be striving towards. Our side is trying to unite people in creating a better society rather than trying to divide people on issues or, as, or even just demonizing people on which solution to these issues is better. And thus we believe that we have the better solution to propaganda on our side. However, on second argument, however, secondly, it actively fuels disestablishmentarianism and supports the idea that a society as a whole has failed. Because when you're drawing all these parallels between this dystopian society and our current society, you begin to feel more and more about the fact that our society is a dystopian society and we can do nothing to fix it. With the sheer mass of negative political material in circulation, people get to see politics as a whole as the problem. Po people see politicians and no matter what, politicians will always be corrupt. No policies will ever create any change. And it promotes this entire mindset of actively thinking that society is a problem and that we shouldn't actually participate in society at all. And societal movements such as goth, punk, or postmodernist cultures have become more and more prevalent to the point that it's almost the norm to think that society has failed and that what we have as a political system isn't good enough and that we should just keep our heads down and do the best we can for ourselves rather than like anything. However, instead, what we should be doing is have positive political fiction to create a goalpost, as I've said many times in our speech, to move towards. Instead of, <coughs> instead of having this kind, what we want to do instead is to have this goalpost. And when we have this goalpost to move towards and we have this common goal that we want to strive towards, we can then analyze exactly what we have against that and what we see as problems. And thus we can in actively decrease the amount of populism and disestablishmentarianism as we have and actually make our society better. And so in conclusion, we believe that negative pop populist fiction only, only serves to create a worse society and make sure that our society reflects that and actively makes people less incentivized to actually do anything. And that's why I'm so proud to propose. Thank you. I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And if the panel is ready, I give the floor to the second speaker of the opposition. Here, here.
Am I audible? Okay, I'm just gonna quickly set up my timer. I'm gonna start. Uh, and TOI is in the chat, please. Starting in three, two, one. Before I move on to my two questions by which to adjudicate this debate and my extension, quickly, two points on framing break. Right? Firstly, what I want to talk about here is that positive fiction does not, is that um, positive fiction is not only like uh, dystopian works with good endings, right? I think to some extent, team proposition in this debate has also have to talk about that in their world, the norm would be some utopian works that describe a world that is like overly positive and engage with the mechanisms that we provided to you in this debate. They can't simply say that they're gonna have like the same kind of, you know, dystopian pessimistic works simply with good endings. I don't think that necessarily is the case. But also secondly, about the positive endings, I think that to some extent we can also have positive endings as long as the book kind of describes a world that's just negative or dystopian. But even if, the, even if that isn't the case, we see no reasons why, for example, you couldn't have author's commentary in terms of how this is a cautionary tale to prevent something and simply say like this is like this work is provided to you to basically like kind of um, create action in society, even if there is a bad ending, right? We think that that still exists under our side of the house. But then moving on to the first question on the, on the question of positive versus negative reinforcement. What we are able to prove here is that we have two things that are exclusive under our side of the house. Firstly, we have urgency and how we have negative reinforcement. Right? That makes you feel like more immediately threatened, thus more immediately like you want to do something about the society and like to like prevent it for, for ex to prevent it from, for example, descending into authoritarianism or like preventing government overreach. And also, secondly, it's more easier to draw parallels with the real world under our side of the house, for example, in terms of things like, you know, when you have extreme government surveillance in 1984, that kind of reflects how today we have tons of security cameras to some extent is less under their side of the house because they have like more like simply utopian works than dystopian works with like good endings that they wanted to talk about. And how this clash is basically, how this clash, to win this clash is incredibly important because what this actually means is that under our side of the house, there, it is more likely that we have more political action, right? That people actually prevent, like the, prevent the rise of authoritarianism or prevent government overreach if we can prove this, right? This is an incredibly important clash. So what are their responses here? What they firstly want to basically talk about is how like basically draw this like alternate benefit. They basically said that they make political views more acceptable under their side of the house because when you paint them in a positive manner, right, people are more likely to people are more likely to simply agree with them, right? And thus you reduce polarization. Firstly, I think that in terms of positive fiction, right? And the utopian positive fiction of some other ideology, I think it is right for the opposite ideology to simply take this work and use it as a cartoon, as a laughing stock of the opposing ideology, because you, at the point at which you are already against that ideology, you're likely to see it as an idealized version and simply say, look how ridiculous it is and look how unattainable it is. And I don't think that that necessarily reduces polarization or makes it more like acceptable from people for the opposite ideology. So I don't think that necessarily reduces polarization. But then secondly, even if it does, we have no reason for people to act actually reach across the aisle because at the point at which a large majority of positive fiction is for example like Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrug which is basically like neoliberal kind of like free market propaganda which would never work for the majority of people because you actually need some like government regulation which that book is specifically against there's no reason why we, why we need to make more people feed into that kind of ideology we would much rather like you know not have many people become some kind of like I don't know right-wing utopians which probably is against what most people want so I don't think this kind of I think this argument has a lot of mechanization to prove that it actually works or is even necessary. But what is that their second and probably better claim? They said that this kind of that this kind of policy would lead to hopelessness and, not, and there would be no reason for people to fight because at the point at which our works provide sad endings, right? In which like the characters basically don't achieve anything, people won't want to fight against this kind of, you know, uh, government overreach, for example, or authoritarianism because they see that nothing can be done. I already talked about how basically, you know, you still can have author's commentary, which says this is a cautionary tale. You can actually do something, even if the book has a bad ending. I don't think that this exists in a vacuum where the author doesn't say anything, right? But then also, secondly, we think that this is actually better if the book provides a worse ending because realize that this is what simply our mechanisms are about, right? Because I just think that most people realize that we are not currently 
in 1984. It is so much, it is a so much more powerful message to say, if you let it go that far, if you allow the government to basically instill overall surveillance and let authoritarianism get that far, you can't get out of that hole. That creates an even bigger sense of urgency and makes people think, I can't simply allow this to get that far. I have to do something. I have to uphold current democratic freedoms. That's much more inspiring to people because it makes them feel even more threatened and creates an even better, bigger like sense of urgency, something that we talked about. With that kind of mechanization, they only reinforce our arguments. We're thinking about by that, we already win this clash, right? But also then thirdly, they talked about how we don't show ways how to solve the problem, right? Firstly, I think that an author, it is simply unlikely that an author can show in a book how to definitively fix a society. I think we already talked about how these books specifically exist to inspire people to do something, but you have actual scholars that in the real world that actually provide solutions to this. I don't think any single author is going to do that for you, right? But also then secondly, um, also then secondly, I don't think that necessarily they can say that every solution that they have on their, on their side of the house is good, because at the point at which it is a utopian work, it can be for many different ideologies. At the point at which it is a utopian work for like a right wing ideology, that solution may not work. There is no reason for them to say that all of the solutions on their side of the house are going to go, be good. I'm going to talk about more in my extension, but under our side of the house, it is more likely that these solutions are, are, are like... Um, associated with much more uh, overall better issues, such as, for example, anti-authoritarianism or anti-government you know, government surveillance. But then secondly, on the question of propaganda, what do we talk about here? You first, I said that, you know, people are, politicians are more likely to latch on, on onto this kind of utopian, you know, books because they can use them as propaganda and saying, oh, my ideology will get you here, right? Like, so this is, this is such a great ideology. And, and you basically like distribute propaganda books in which this kind of like, you know, positive ideology is put into. And now secondly, even if we assume that it exists under our side of the house with like, with, um, like negative pessimistic books that has additional trickle down benefits because at that point you're more likely to like have you know actually recognize some harms like government surveillance or authoritarianism that are likely to trickle down even if we assume that politicians use these books and this is the reason why in propaganda their side is comparatively worse what they say here and what their response is is that like because uh um because because these books have less of a you know a positive message that um because these books have less of a positive message, um, and because these books have less of a positive message, um, moving on to my extension, oh, it is more unlikely, um, oh, it is more likely that like uh, political movements, um, okay, yeah, moving on to my extension, why it is more likely that we would have united political movements under our side of the house. And this is a more incredibly important class, because even if we assume that have, they have marginally more efficacy in terms of like, you know, these like positive reinforcement being more inspiring, we get a more united reaction. Because everybody disagrees with what like the perfect solution for world problems currently is, right? We think that people have many different like views on how to solve the world right now in terms of like positive outlook, right? Like people disagree on what the ultimate utopia is. It could be like a right-wing utopia or a left-wing utopia. Like, that, because of that, comparatively under their side of the house, you get simply a less united response on how to improve the world. Under our side of the house, we already see that most like pessimistic works are dominated by anti-authoritarianism, anti like, you know, um, like having simply more ideological diversity or having like less government overreach, which kind of creates a more united response because many different people subscribe to that. We think that because of that, because hey, I have that more common mindset, the things that we do under our side of the house and the policy that we implement under our side of the house is more likely to be simply more united, even if we assume that like positive reinforcement is marginally better. And that is because that is why we win this debate. I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And if everyone is ready, I give the floor to Tim Proposition for their third speech. Here, here. Oh, am I audible? Okay, my pronouns are she, her, and I prefer my POIs verbally. All right, I'll start. I'll start in three, two, one. Side proposition throughout side opposition throughout this whole debate has constantly crossed the bench, saying that all our positive political fiction can only be about all these utopias. And it does not matter that 
apparently it does not matter that we keep telling you that all these positive political fiction, what they actually look like, according to the examples given by the info slide, they look like Fahrenheit 451 or West Wing or, or Stranger in a Strange World, who are, what are actually dystopian no novels, but have good endings. The point of po positive political fiction and what it, what sets it apart from this pessimistic political fiction is that this pessimistic fiction gives you only the problems. It's It looks like Brave New World or Animal Farm, where they all only show you all the problems with this political agenda or with this world. And but but the main character never gets to actually fight it off and actually win. The main character never get, sees hope at the end of the tunnel. And at the end of the day, they always get oppressed by the system. That's what these pessimistic political agendas are supposed to look like. On our side of the house, positive political agendas are, have characters who actually are successful in some ways to actually bring their dystopian governments to a better light. They are the characters who actively strive to make the status quo in their world better and actually succeed in some way or another. This can be seen from Fahrenheit 451 or West Winger or A Stranger in a Strange World. Now, even the, okay, fine. Let's say that whatever side opposition has been saying, we accept it. Even then, side, every mechanism that side opposition has thrown at, at us about all this pessimistic and dystopian world world fiction scaring the public into into taking action we believe that this is far worse because at this point when side opposition see, side opposition confirms to us that these um the populist rhetoric that these people are going to feel actual shock and appall at the dystopian things they see in these pessimistic novels. We believe that the populist rhetoric will actually worsen and politicians will be taking advantage of this, of these fears and actually make, make it during when they're running for elections, they'll actually, what they'll actually say is, have you read this novel, right? We've seen the parallel and they'll actually do an analysis for you maybe. And then they'll go, if you do not want such a terrible and shocking world, vote for me because I can make it better for you. By using the people's fear of this absolute appalling dystopian novel with no hope at the end of the tunnel, these politicians are going to end up using the public sphere and actually uh, exploit the people's fears. This is the world side opposition is advocating for. Now, they also, first of all, a few, bits of rebuttals on the urgency and then the people deriving par parallels from this. Now, first of the, firstly, the urgency exists on both sides of the house, because as we've told you, these positive, positive political fiction is actually showing you about all the uh, terrible, uh, terrible problems in the in the parliament or in the societies. So whatever so when people actually read these positive uh, fictions, they'll actually also get another they'll also feel a sense of urgency that there is a real problem. And this is a completely symmetrical on both sides. What isn't is the people while reading pessimistic uh, fictions will think, oh, this problem that exists in the status quo that I can also see from this parallel can never be fixed. And they'll constantly have this despair and lack of hope in their lives where they think that whatever all the misdoings of the government and the shortcomings of their own political agendas are just the way it is and there's no way to stop it. Hope at the end of the tunnel. Yes, before I move on. Winston in 1984 only couldn't achieve his goal because he allowed it to get that far, right? We're not currently at that spot. Isn't it more likely that people would simply react, oh, we can't let it get that far at the point at which we can't fix the government or do anything about it? My point still stands because when people, okay, let's think about the authoritarian states opposition brought themselves, uh, brought to the table themselves. They tell us that these in these, uh, these uh, negative uh, political fiction, when they're talking about authoritarian states, they'll only show us like all the terrible things and that's supposed to be a shock factor for the Western people. What about the people in these authoritarian regimes? What would these people think when they read these uh, pessimistic political fiction? What they'll see is that the regime they're currently stuck under is actually never going to be able to be overthrown. What they'll see is not the shock because they live through that shock every day. What they'll see is that there's no hope for them. This is the world opposition wants. 
Now, moving on to our rebuttals. Firstly, is positive information? No, thank you. Better, the better way to motivate individuals. To this, from our side of the house, we've told you that because our individuals can act, who are all these children grow up reading this positive political fiction, they can actually have uh, hope for the, for the future that when they grow up, they'll see all the shortcomings in the in their own With government information. actually be changed and there is they can constantly strive for change. This is what side proposition is advocating for, but as I've already as I've already uh, stated, op in opposition's world, all these people will only be completely hopeless, or they're going, or either they're going to be completely exploited by the politicians who are going to be using their fears against them. Now, so on both in motivating the individuals and how we, how positive fiction actually gives these people the courage and the. Uh, and the hope that they can go against the system and win, this is the moment that side proposition should be winning this debate. But we have more Good information. No, oh, thank you. Which side has more polarization? So because what does populist rhetoric do? And what does these negative uh, political fictions do? Negative political fiction only tells you about the problems in this in these political regimes. For example, in Animal Farm, you can see all the shortcomings of communism. But at the end of the day, at the end of the novel, you nothing gets solved. There is no hope for everyone who is uh, oppressed under that regime. This kind of novels, this kind of uh, narrative is constant is constantly used by politicians to polarize the community. This looks like U.S. politicians antagonizing communists. This look to the point where uh, to the point that people can't act, people actually fear have this actual fear instilled in them that communism is com as a completely bad thing. When in fact, taken under a different light taken under a more moderate light, there are so many benefits to it and no one actually sees it because all they see is the terrible things from it. Side proposition advocates for a world where the positive light actually shows us the, all the shortcomings of these political ideologies, but they also tell us that all these, even though they have their own flaws, because nothing is perfect, right? They can actually be solved. That the individuals in these societies can so strive for a change and, and actually better their political ideologies. This is the world side proposition is advocating for. I am so proud to propose. Thank you. I thank the speaker for the fine speech. And I now give the floor to the third speaker of team opposition here, here. Hi, right, just a second. Okay. Uh, firstly, am I audible, invisible, and everything? Great. Starting in three, two, one. Panel, notice that most of their case basically rests upon this sort of base assumption of how the books end or how the books go. Notice that neither side has probably read most or even like a significant proportion of like political literature that, that's specifically fictional, right? Notice that we're giving you far more mechanisms that support this as opposed to simply asserting like the endings, the specific way the books go. You have to judge this debate on the mechanisms, not on the specific characterizations, but I will deal with those as well. 
So the three main clashes I have in my speech are firstly about the incentives to act, secondly about the narratives that are pushed by books, and lastly about the impact on the readers specifically. So onto the first clash about the incentives to act. There's sort of key claim here that like crystallize in their second speech is that there's a carrot on their side and a stick on our side. Two main responses to this. Firstly, about this very, very key characterization for them, that basically our books give them hope. And, uh, and so, well, for them, yes, the proposition, propositions books basically give people hope and oppositions books basically put people down. Three responses to this. A, this is simply not exclusive. You can have like, you know, a book demonizing authoritarian states and in the end, like they managed to fix this state. Like Fahrenheit 451 is a disputable book on which side it lands. But B, notice how we've responded to this every time and they haven't like given us a further response here about the fact that we don't live in that society currently. So it's more of a warning call about what could happen in the future as opposed to actually being like, okay, here's what the future looks like. Now let's, um, you know, like all give up because there's no hope left in the world. But see, we dispute this premise like in its entirety, right? Because we think that like under the capitalist system, people are pushed down constantly when they have constant failures in their lives. But they continue like kicking in this case, like Winston does in 1984, simply because they are humans and like want to continue on their lives and want to continue to strive for things. I mean, don't think necessarily that even having a bad ending, even if this is true that all of our books have bad endings, necessarily means that it de demoralizes people to the point at which they don't act. They want to prevent this in the first place, but even if the system still exists, they kick against it, they fight against it in whatever way they can because they are human and they want a better world. So secondly though, um, the sort of the impetus to act here. What we've said from the start is that when you draw parallels with only the good stuff, you settle into this comfortable state of sort of, you know, the, the warmer water where you relax because you can, you can often find like, you can cherry pick the good stuff in the books. Whereas on our side of the house, we have far more sort of shocking revelations and things when you draw these parallels, as opposed to, you know, the specific things like that you draw from the book end up being positive towards the way the world exists right now. We would far rather have this specific punch of the shock um, so that we can like ultimately gain some sort of action on our side of the house. So the stick is simply better than the carrot because people sort of get accustomed to having carrots all the time and don't wanna take any specific action. But then the second layer under this and the nuance that the team proposition didn't notice in our case is that we offer more realism. We've said this from first, that basically like global warming is going to destroy the planet in the coming, you know, 100 years at the current rate at which we're headed, right? Authoritarian states are only becoming worse. We think that these are very specific, like things that are pointed out in these books that we need for people to understand these issues because, and they're also just a lot closer to what exists under our, like under society more. So they're more likely to buy into these ideas and take action on them. Whereas on their side of the house, there's a lot of pipe dreams. So uh, thirdly then under this clash, about this claim that they have for a common goal to strive towards. Two main responses here. Firstly, the, the whole idea of a common goal doesn't exist. My second speaker talked about this in, their, in his extension and there wasn't a reply to this. So basically there isn't just one book pointing out a common goal, right? There's like a plethora of books on different ideologies that each pull to their own direction. So ultimately you don't arrive at the common goal. You actually have a less connected message because in general, like authoritarian, like uh, books point out, you know, all the examples are about authoritarian states, about surveillance and about the suppression of free speech, as opposed to on their side, you know, you have the people ide idealizing like conservatism. You have the people idealizing communism. They all can't agree. And there isn't like a singular punch from the literature. But then secondly, we also think that just sort of, we get the better movements on our side of the house. When we talk about specifically, like our ideas that we strive towards are just simply like in the vast majority of cases likely to be better ideas because they talk about like issues that we care about. We've characterized this already about free speech, about 
you know, um, freedom of movement of expression and liberties that people have. Before I move on to the second clash, I'll take that POI. No. You're muted. Sorry, I, I cannot waste any more of my time. Sorry. Um, secondly, then, the, about the narratives that are pushed. Three, uh, three main points under this. Firstly, about this idea that basically uh, that fears ruin politics, right? That they basically said that politicians will exploit fears to push their own narratives to things. So, firstly, uh, first response to this is basically so, what are these fears in the first place? Because this is important. Like, um, if, it's, if it's a fear of something reasonable, we would rather the public have this fear than not have this fear. I think we've characterized this enough. Uh, about what these fears are like. They're likely to be against authoritarianism for more liberties and so on, especially in the Western world. So secondly, the, the fears specifically motivate somebody to take action as opposed to sort of, you know, setting out this utopia because often politicians exploit the utopias as we described in our first to basically claim that like the current system we're working towards is this utopia. And so we should just continue on this path and basically make marginal improvements. Whereas on our side of the house, we at least have some sort of like impetus to specifically like do something about it, get more political action, more political action is simply better. And they had a quick claim here about authoritarian states. The thing is like authoritarian states, they don't read political fiction. And if they do, it basically only glorifies the state that they're already in. And then third clash about the impact on readers. They had like a small claim here about polarization, right? That people are simplified down to the, to the very core of their idea when you only read like literature that fears them, right? But the, the, they needed to find like the actual delta that happens from their side of the house. Because when you like read books of the opposing side, and it just idealizes that specific ideology or whatever, you think of those books as cartoons because you have already like, you know, built up some sort of fundamental political beliefs. You won't suddenly flip to, to understand it more because it's built, it's written for the people who already buy into the idea in the first place. So as an outsider, it's very hard to suddenly gain some sort of buy-in from this book. So you're unlikely to actually like change your opinion to another side by reading this idea, you're and far less likely than that to normalize that other side. I thank the speaker for the fine speech, and I now give the floor to team opposition for their reply. Here, here. Okay, uh, I have an audible and visible. Start in just a second. Okay, three, two, one. Panel, let's imagine this random guy. Let's call him like, okay, Winston. Uh, some sort of British surname, Winston Smith, okay? Winston kind of engages in politics, uh, but he also kind of doesn't. He's really confused. He doesn't really know what's urgent, what really needs his attention. But then Winston starts reading more dystopian books. Winston realizes that the current rise of authoritarianism, of polarization, if extended into the future, if extended more dramatically, will mean that he will lose most of what he calls important in his life. Now Winston realizes he needs to act. On which side is Winston more likely to act? I'll have two clashes about this. Firstly, about what these books actually look like, what they portray, and secondly, about real world change. So the first clash is logically prior to everything else. We prove that they portray that they portray uh, people, you know, incent they incentivize people to, to act because of the way they portray the world. And then we take also like, the then we, we move on to the second clash. So we told you, right, that, okay, a large like portion of this debate has been talking about the endings in these like, uh, of, of these books, right? We told you from the very first speech, I remember I was there, right? From the very first speech, we told you it's not clear why this is exclusive to one side or the other. What Prof had to defend was a book or like, I don't know, some sort of like, you know, form of literature in which there's a general positive take takeaway, and we defend one in which there's a negative takeaway, i.e. utopia versus dystopia. But sure, 
even if we do not have these good endings on our side of the house, if I think if you have a bad ending, if you see literally the status quo, but a little more dramatic, and you see people fight and not succeed against it, you realize that you're not in a big brother state, right? You realize that your country has not progressed to that extent, or at least I hope it hasn't, right? Probably hasn't, right? So you see, and you are actually motivated even more because you don't want that to happen to you. Even on the metrics that they have been defending the most rigorously, we still win, right? But furthermore, I think that they've like mischaracterized a lot of these books, as we've told you, right? It's not that Animal Farm is like inherently against communism. It's rather against state surveillance. It's rather against like authoritarian authoritarianism. We're not talking exclusively about like specific ideologies. We're more talking about these general rhetorics that everyone agrees are bad, such as authoritarianism, surveillance, things like that, right? But then onto the second clash, which is the most important one about which side, on which side are people more incentivized to actually change anything, right? So real world change. They have uh, propos like two like layers here. Firstly, they tell you, oh, you know, good feelings uh, evoked by these books are better because when you have a bad rhetoric, it leads to hopelessness. We think that this like is not the case, right? I mean, okay, if you look, a, uh, if you read a book in which um, uh, there's some sort of uprising in the capital and now you've got like racist uh, supremacists in power, right? You might think, hmm, where have I seen this one before, right? You like, when you link those parallels, you see, huh, had that insurrection gone a little differently, we would be living in a very different country. Had this like polarization been more extended, we would be living in a different country. Had we voted in another populace, or if we will in the future, we can live in a very authoritarian state. I think in these instances, people are more likely because of the fear that we have outlined in our first speech, right? Down the bench, because of this, people are more likely to take action because they want to like, they want that not to be the case, right? Then their second like line of reasoning is that, oh, you know, this increases populism and polarization. We told you no, right? Based on like what I told you in the first clash, this is likely to generally be against like, like, uh, like things that everyone, you know, agrees with things like authoritarianism and surveillance. And honestly, honestly, if that like the, the narrative now is that, oh, climate change extended into a future and into a dystopia is very, very bad. And populists can actually like, like, uh, like actually change this to an extent. I'm fine as long as like they start actually having climate action. I think that when these issues are highlighted and someone's doing something about them, this greatly impacts the world we live in. And that is something we're worth like trading away. Panel, I think that Winston Smith deserves a better future and he needs to be motivated to get there. I thank the speaker for the fine speech and I now give the floor to Tim Proposition for their reply. Here, here. <clears throat> All right, just want to double check for the last time if I'm visible and audible. It would be very embarrassing to speak for four minutes and have no mic on. Anyway, I will begin my reply speech in three, two, one. Now, not to sugarcoat this debate, we both sides have had two different forms of framing, and it's and it's been a bit of a two ships passing in the night kind of. However, both sides have been able to engage with each other, and it's based on which arguments actively work on both framings is, is the side that wins this debate. Now, side opposition has constantly given us examples of how, in, both in their framing and on our framing, negative political fiction works as a motivator in order to create change through shock value and through dystopia. Now, first of all, we have rejected their framing by telling everyone that most positive fiction is dystopia. No one wants to read a book more than 20 pages on a utopia, and thus we believe that our side framing does work better. However, even if we accept their framing, our arguments still hold water on both sides of this debate, where we take both the utopian dystopian framing and the positive ending negative ending framing. Our first argument was about how, <coughs> our first argument was about how, First argument was how political fiction normalizes all ideologies to make sure that all sides are able to be represented and create this idea to strive towards. We have our side has consistently has consistently shown the benefits of showing of showing how these positive effects happen and the incentives that can bring people to work towards them. And our second argument has expanded on this on how the individual's role in the system works and how we can create both a societal and an individual's movement towards a better society. Side opposition's case, however, has constantly focused on the efficacy of negative fiction in creating a movement that's based on shock value. Side opposition's main, side opposition's main tactical flaw was on this shock value, because this shock value 
idea on which they base how we can move people towards this by showing parallels between them, by showing that how we can create better solutions by identifying these problems. We believe that side opposition, most of their arguments actually exist on both sides of the bench and work for both side proposition and opposition. Their main unique benefits on having this negative fiction is to create this kind of dissent towards the pot, towards the current system. And even then, we believe that we have to take this debate because their benefit actively has the harm of disestablishmentarianism and populist propaganda against these kinds of issues. And as we believe that their side does not, it is not able to exist outside of their own framing. Now, finally, on to address, on to addressing the, the case extension that side opposition gave on exactly how they have different kinds of fiction for different kinds of things and how side proposition somehow has millions of different ideas that, they, that we need to strive towards and thus this loses solvency. How we do not see how this rebuttal has any less value on our, on our side of the debate as negative ideas and negative representations of things are just as countless as positive representations and positive ideas of things. Thus we believe that once again, upside opposition has consistently existed on both sides of the bench without giving any actual benefits as to how specifically negative endings and or dystopian fiction actually benefits them specifically. On their own framing, they fight for both sides and actively show that in general political fiction is good. On our framing, they show that their negative endings only create this kind of dis 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 discouragement towards the current system and they don't actively show how people are going to be incentivized more towards actual activism rather than just general counterculture and creating this idea of being complacent. We believe that in conclusion, our side is creating a utopia in the minds of people in order to create, into, in order to motivate people towards it, whereas their side is only cre creating dissent and only reinforcing the very ideas that their own fiction creates, and that's why we believe we win. Thank you. I thank the speaker for the fine speech and everyone for this fine debate. Cross floor virtually, shake hands and talk to each other while we go to deliberate. I will stop the recording.